Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode. I, of course, love your host. Um, yo, we got Team Supreme with us. Uh, start with Sugar Steve. Hello. Sugar Steve, what's up, man? Everything's good, you know, working half as hard as I normally do, but still uh, getting You're by. not working half as hard, man. You you got you got a you got a really like monumental jazz. I'm sorry. No, I meant getting paid half as much as I normally do. There you go. Oh, my fault. Okay. My fault. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> I can't help you there. <laughs> uh, I'm Pete Bill. What's up, bro? You know, man, halfway through the summer, living life, driving around children. That's driving it. Driving around children. That's what I do. I'm like a bus service for my kids. That's my life. Getting ready for the street. That's right. New yeah. season. New what what season of Sesame Street are you guys about to get into? We're wrapping 54, maybe, and starting 55. I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. So September. There you go. I'm, I'm Pay Bill was just explaining to us that um, Sesame Street is exempt from uh, the uh, current writer strike and acting strike. Yep. Uh, as well. So. So I get paid the same amount of money, Steve. Sadly, sorry. Well, yeah, I saw some Muppets crossing the picket line the other day, though. So. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right, and uh, Von Tigolo, what's up, bro? What's happening, bro? Good, man. We are uh, getting ready. Uh, we just announced today, uh, Made in Durham, Little Brother Block Party. So, uh, oh, what's up? So it's like y'all, y'all little picnic joint. Like, like what? Nah, what is it? Our shit is one day and one day only, and it's for a limited amount of time for <laughs> hours, and and then we going to fuck home. So <laughs> this is one day. <laughs> it's not a three if Fonte day. just want to go to fuck home, yeah, I know. Yeah. Always, what? always. He yeah, must have the nicest house. <laughs> little brother, little brother, big crit, cool kids, on top black guy, uh, DJs, Hourglass and Wally Sparks, uh, spinning, and Sam J, uh, hosting. So, uh, Good. October 7th, uh, downtown Durham, uh, little brother NC, hit us up. October 7th, October 7th, yeah. Damn, okay. Is, is this, uh, for the 20th anniversary of the listening? Yeah, yeah, 20th anniversary. With 20th anniversary, just a little brother, period. You know what I mean? We wanted to do it, do something in our hometown. Are y'all doing like the entire album from start to finish? Yeah, or? Nah, I would never do that shit. Nah, I, when people come to see little brother, like, I don't like them whole, we gonna do the whole album. Fuck all that. Like, people came to hear the jams. So if it's 20 years, we celebrating the whole catalog. I get it. Okay. That's what's up. Um, So, people, it's, of course, uh, we all know it's hip hop's. 50th anniversary um yes, so pretty much we are um going in heavy on the conversations with uh you know our legends our participants our our uh delegates our ambassadors of the culture um and what can i say our, our next guest is a legend a legend of the mix you know i, I Kind of credit our our guests for really elevating, uh, the 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 role of the DJ. Um, it was it was through him that uh you know I first heard the seeds of of ideas I didn't know we could do. I didn't I didn't know that you could take an acapella from one record and mm -hmm. mix it with another record, and you know just the amount of of road trips that I've done in my life, even pre roots, uh with his mixtapes as the soundtrack. Um, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's to me, some of, some of the, the, the best moments of my life, hanging with my friends, uh, high school and early, early college years for me. Um, our guest raps, he produces, um, definitely a, a, a very recognizable voice and scream. And his, his DJ echo voice game is, is, is unmatched. Um, mm -hmm. He's been in the culture uh, three decades plus and counting, um, you know, Grammy award winning albums. And, and you know, he's he, shit. He's he has one accolade that you and I don't have unpaid bill. This this gentleman is on a Pulitzer Prize winning record. You know, of course, younger fans might know of him as the the narrative voice of 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 uh, uh, yeah. Kenny's uh, damn album. You know what happens but, on earth stays on earth. Right, exactly. But you know, our our guest is has has just been ubiquitous with probably the best things about the culture. Like one of the best party DJs ever. Um, 
What can I say, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome, Kid Capri, to Quest Love Supreme. Yes, yes. What an intro! What an intro! Jesus Christ! It's getting better <laughs> over time. Really, I did all that. <laughs> What'd you say? I did all that. <laughs> nah, yeah, yeah, man, you did all that, man. It's, you know, it's, it's it's time for that, man. It's time for that. Thank How are you man. today, man? Where 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 you call? Where where you speaking to us from? Where are you right now? I'm in my studio. Okay, you're still yeah, New Yorker, I see. I, I assume. Yep, in Jersey. Oh, okay, a Jersey. Yeah, live in Jersey. I, I, I consider Jersey, New York, New, York. New York. Everybody was on top of each other in New York. I had to get away. Come over to Jersey when I want to go to New York and go over it. Come back to Jersey. Let me ask you because you know a lot of um the soldiers or or the participants of the 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 part of hip hop culture that um I grew up on and and I'm I'm a part of and that you're part of as well um a lot of them probably in the mid to late 90s decided to migrate down south you know mm -hmm. a lot of our new york legends like went to maryland and then mm -hmm. went to north them. carolina and atlanta and whatnot um how you know for you though like what what has kept you in the city of new york because it's almost rare to see um someone from your era that's still staying in new york city like even yeah, jay-z yeah. don't live in new york no more like it's almost like i'm pressed to find any hip-hop legend that's not still living in new york yeah um it's my feel man it's the feel it's 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 what i grew up on i've been around the world i've been many places there's places that i would go and move but i know i will move there for a short period of time but it's just something about being around New York. I'm not even in New York. I'm in Jersey. I'm right over the bridge, but I can get to New York when I'm ready, you know. But it's just the feel of 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 New York, of 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 everything. It's, I come from the Bronx. I was born in Brooklyn. I was raised in the Bronx, home to hip hop. I was raised five minutes away from Hurt or Cambridge Terrace. Hurt, Cedar Avenue was five minutes away. So it's just that feel of it. But then also my daughters is there. You know, my engineers there, my road man, everything I need is right here. I'm looking for a house right now in this area, a new house in, in this area right now to move into. But I, I considered moving to Atlanta before in Houston and the, the price of living is way different, it's way better. But I just feel like I need to be here. I need to, I, if I move somewhere else, I'm going to lose something. So that's what it pretty yeah. much is for me. Yeah. Okay. Home is home. I get it. Yeah. That's what's up. Um, you know, for uh, the 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 very few that listen to our show that aren't familiar with your story, um, you know, I want to talk about your beginnings of the culture. Like for you, well, okay, you're a DJ. Um, mm -hmm. What first of all, what like what environment did you grow up in as far as like your your love of music? Did you grow up in a in a sort of an open format household where music was prevalent or you know how did my granddad my dad was a soul singer he sung he was the first soul singer to sing with the lebron brothers lebron brothers is a latin band that's a well well renowned latin band that's towards the world right now and they made an album in 1960 they made two albums they made one in 68 and 169 he was the first soul singer with a latin band and then he left and started doing northern soul himself and he, he became really good he had a record called baby hard times in 73 that did good for him so he was always you know doing his thing my grandfather his what, father, what was his name dave love he had okay. a record called baby hard times and okay. his father my grandfather he was a trumpet player which i have his trumpet he brought in 1940 he used to sit in with miles davis count basie theolonius he's sitting with all these guys and all these sessions and play with them um, so the music always been in my family. It always been around. As, at four years old, I started playing drums. <laughs> How about okay. that? I started playing drums at four years old. And at the time, we had a record player that you had to stand over and look over. And there's the big TV on the record player. You had to look over into the turntable. I used to play the turntable. I didn't know what I was doing. No DJing or nothing. But I was playing these James Brown records and, you know, these records with breaks in it. And it just it was just attractive to me as a little kid. So at eight years old, when hip hop came alive, that's when I started DJing. And from there on, I never stopped. And, you know, it all came from me growing up, knowing all the music, all the funk music and the soul music from my father and my grandfather. All right. It, it's it's rare for us to have someone that was actually raised in, in the epicenter of the culture. Um, could you typically just walk me through 
uh, walk me through a day in which you are experiencing what we know as hip hop culture. Like what days do what days do these uh block parties happen? Like what's what's typical for like what they're DJing? What do the speakers look like? What what does the equipment look like? Just walk me through your observation of like uh, back, uh a back, typical Bronx hip hop experience. Back in the days before there was hip hop records, it was just the break beats, it was just the MCs rhyming over the break beats, DJs uh arguing over which records they could cut, like Freedom and Apache and I Can't Stop and records like that. Arguing? And arguing. Like it, it would be it'd be crazy because it'd be seven, eight DJs and one MC. Right. And because the DJ was so much more, it was so much more to remember the MC didn't come and be so prevalent until records came out. But when, when you had the Furious Five, we had Fantastic, we had Cold Crush. It was always the DJ first. Charlie Chase and the Cold Crush, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, you know, Grand Wizard Theater and the Fantastic. So it was always about the DJ more. Um, so they will argue about who will cut each re what records they will cut because there were so many DJs on this party. Um, so that's what the, it was. That it was uh going to the record shop trying to find the records and standing in the in the block parties and DJing in the rain while it's raining and the crowd still coming and they stand out there and party with you. You ain't making no money. You're blowing your equipment up, all that. But it was so much of we, we wanted to have so much fun and want people to see what we're doing that we didn't mind it. We just had we just went out there and did our thing and it didn't matter what block it was at. We were set up on a pole, plug up to a pole. And that was the beginning of it. And we would just keep going from there. And this went on for a lot of years before records even came about. And even after records came about, it still went on. But before records came about, it was more contained. You know, and, and keep in mind, this is a time when they're telling us, yo, that's just noise y'all doing. Y'all ain't going to last long. They ain't going to be here long. What are y'all doing? 50 years later, I'm over here talking with Quest Love. Uh, thank you. Yo, so, okay, like, all right, so technical questions I always wanted to know or get answers to. So, you know, everyone knows, or at least uh, for those that don't know, the legend, of course, of, of the first hip-hop party, August 11th, 1973. Mm -hmm. Cool Herc throws a party for his baby sister, Cindy, mm -hmm. and he gets this epiphany that he's just going to, instead of making you wait for the highlight, which, of course, like, if you're playing a six, seven minute jam, um, there's always like a eight to 16 bar, 16 bar part of the song. That's the breakdown. That's the best part of the song. It's just the drums and everyone goes crazy for those 16 bars. And then it's over. And of course, Cool Herc's idea was like, let me just play all the drum breaks at once. You know, play Give It Up for Turn It Loose by James Brown and then play some by the uh, you know, incredible bongo band, just play the breaks. So I'm under the impression that these parties last for what five hours at least. Yeah, because when they used to, when, when uh, uh, the first time I heard hip hop, right? I'm on my block. This kid named this guy named Joe, he has some dice in his hand. He's going, Yes, yes, y'all, to the beat, y'all, and he's throwing the dice. And I'm standing there looking at him. I said, What do you mean, yes, yes, y'all? What is he saying? He's kept saying it, yes, yes, y'all. To the beach, y'all. I'm like, yo, what's he saying? So that Friday, I went to uh, Marbury Hill Projects. They used to have the parties in the community center. You get to pay for a dollar to come in and go see Rockwell Incorporated, DJ B Ward, Kevin Kev Rockwell, all of them. They were right there, and I seen DJ B Ward playing. And I seen the MC on the mic with the echo. Yes, yes, y'all, y'all to the beach, y'all, y'all. I said, oh shit. So I'm standing there watching, and then I ran home. I said, yo, mom, I want to be a DJ. She said, what's that? She bought me a mixer that had no headphone hole. It was a Gemini mixer. It was just a Phono 1, Phono 2, aux and a mic. No headphone, no plug to plug it in. And I had to guess all the spots on the record. That's how I got better than everybody else in the neighborhood. Because I had no headphones to work with. Right, wow. I had no headphones to wear. And I'm eight years old standing on top of a milk crate. These older dudes are looking at me like, who is this little kid's bugging? No headphones, busting their ass. And a girl named Olga Carter that was in our... That was in our um circle. The young girl, she was 13 years old at the time. She said, Kick your priest sounded like a good name for a DJ. At the time, my name was DJ Dr. Spank. It was a terrible name. But she said, Kick your priest sounded like a good name for a DJ while we going in the classroom. 
I ended up trying to name six months later, she was shot and killed by a stray bullet by accident. Oh, so man. I ended up keeping the name. Yeah, uh, her name was Aubrey Carter. And, and, and I ended up keep, keeping the name, took me to the top. But I was there from the beginning watching all of this and, and being a part of it and seeing what it is. That's why I appreciate my career so much because it wasn't something that was just given to me. It was something I went through all of the phases of getting doors closed and everything that I had to do with just having, just learning the business and being a part of it and learning to appreciate what you have when you, and knowing when you didn't have it, you know what I'm saying? And, and I was there for that. So I appreciate it in a big way. So when you're spinning these records and of course, like, you know, if you study the B-Boy Bible, um, of course, now, like people know, like the the foundational breaks of the culture, you know, like your let's dance by pleasure or get up and dance by, uh, you know, freedom or or those particular records, which weren't necessarily hits. You know, they these weren't songs that were played on radio. So what I want to know is. All right. So take take a break like um, Catch a Groove by Juice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. a song that was not a radio song, it was not a hit, but yet was a staple for hip hop parties. How do you, like, what is, what is, what would be a, a DJ's version of like Cashbox Billboard magazine to know, oh man, I gotta get Planetary Citizen because that has a drum break in it. Like, and how, how do you find these breaks? Like back in, between uh you know 77 to even 84 before like the ultimate beats and breaks compilations were made which put all those breaks on one record i mean how typical was it for you to go to uh a local mom and pop record store to see you know uh a bunch of james brown give it up for turn loose or funky drummers just like in the bin you had like, to go to you had to go to certain stores and what would happen is a lot of stores started bootlegging records. When the DJ thing got big, when, when, when uh, hip hop started, like Blow Your Head. Blow Your Head was never a 45 or never a 12 inch. They made okay. a white label of Blow Your Head. So that was became so big. All these James Brown's Blow Your Head, out. yeah. Yeah, all the Apaches that came out was all bootleg Apaches. They, it was different, different labels that put it out, like different, um, I guess independent labels or whatever. So the, boot, like, those like Bozo Miko labels and those Paul Winley All labels. Well, Paul Winley, Paul Winley was official. Paul Winley was the one that put out the the, the uh, super disco breaks. Right. He would get clearance for all these break beats and put them on these albums and put these albums out. But Paul Winley was the first one, was the one that put Chiba Chiba out with George Benson. Right. She, uh, yo, so he did that before the super disco base. So he was in in that realm and he did it. The, he kind of did it the right way, um, but. A, a lot of a, a lot of times, like a records was uh in downstairs records on Thirty Fourth Street, uh um downtown, uh Forty Third Street. They, they would take these forty fives and make these forty fives of these downstairs records, and these forty fives would become just as important as finding the original record, because it was a limited amount of them. Like my man Louis Lou, he still have those downstairs records. Those downstairs records, like Planetary and Citizen and records like that. These was were recorded. Planetary and Citizen was never forty five. So. To have that is like a gem. You know what I'm saying? You're talking about then, a breakbeat I, Louis, Louis Flores? No, my, my other man, Louis Lou, Louis Lou down, downtown. Okay. He, Louis Lou downtown, we grew up together. He was in 82, 83. This dude would have, he was, they used to call him Little Bambada. He had so much stuff way back then. And he's still collecting, like he's still doing it. So, you know, um, we was way ahead of the game. But a lot of stuff, like I said, a lot of stuff got bootlegged on 45. And that's how we got it. Because a lot of times, we didn't know the names and stuff. We didn't know what it was. And even more now that I got older, I didn't realize how much stuff was in the world. I got so much from work, Brazil and just so many different places around the world. But when we were coming up with the Accenture break beats, we didn't think that far. You know what I'm saying? We were, we were, we were going about what Bam was playing, what uh, Charlie Chase was playing, what Flash and it was playing. We were, that's how we knew what to play. And how we found out the names is because they were bootleg the records. You know what I'm saying? So that's how we would go. We go to the record shop, be a whole bootleg section. We just grab what we needed. We had it. I can't stop. White label. Like it was, that's how we got our people. Oh, okay. That explains it. Cause uh I was gonna say, um, maybe uh, five months ago, 
um, Cool Herc had auctioned off uh, a, a good portion of 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 his gems and whatnot, some artwork, some flyers, uh, memorabilia, and some of his records. So I copped um, like four or five of those records. And I was like, well, wait a minute. These are just white labels. These aren't the original ones. But I always wanted to know like how prevalent and how and how much of an abundance was like uh, an impeach the president back in 79, 80, 81, 82, you know. Impeach, impeach, you know what? Impeach got more rarer to get in the later years. Earlier years, it was a little easier to get, but it still wasn't, it still wasn't something that anybody could just get. You know what I'm saying? Like you had to really know that beat. Like like Louis, he was Louis was the first one I heard play that, and you know he was just so in depth with what was going on. You know what I'm right. saying? But the regular person that just wanted break beats, they didn't know impeach. They didn't know. They knew. They knew the regular things that they heard on the tapes. And then later on, impeach became more prevalent. What What year um, would you say was like the 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 highlight of or the pinnacle? of downtown records like for you if you're an upstart dj post say if you're like pioneer 1.5 this is what i took from lo pioneer 1.5 um like post flash post theodore and post bam and and hurt is downtown records like your your mecca is that the only place like where would you shop for records in new york city oh downtown um r and r record on fort on fortum road um, music world on 34th Street. Uh, but what was interesting is that there used to be a Crazy Eddie on Ford and Road in the Bronx. Oh, now, wow. I remember I was in Crazy Eddie this day, right? Check this out. I was in Crazy, Crazy Eddie this day. Yeah. And Cowboy and Mr. Ness, Scorpio, they walked in Crazy Eddie. They had on boots and leather and feathers and all that, but they were rock <laughs> stars to me. It was like looking at these dudes like, Right. right. Okay. So they came in, seen them, they left. And this dude walks in with a box. Now, what they used to do with Crazy Eddie, they would take the new record that's out and put it on top of the uh, counter and play the album out in the store. This dude comes in with a box. They pull the record out and it was Captain Sky Super Sperm. Boom. He puts it okay. on top of the counter. He plays the album. The super sperm part comes in. I hear it run to the front. Yo, what the hell is that? Give me two of those. I bought two of those and I bought two Sears for cookies. I think I'm the very first dude with super sperm, man, because I was there the day it came in. And it, never, really? it wasn't out before that. So I think I'm the very first dude with super sperm. And then they did, uh, and then they remade the album and put Dr. Rock on the album. Okay, yeah. Right, right. So, but the original super sperm album didn't have Dr. Rock on it. And I was there that day. And crazy Eddie the day it came in. So I was there in the, I was trying to get everything at this time, but there wasn't a lot of places. I, I didn't know a lot of names or stuff. So I would just get it as I go. But crazy Eddie started, started bootlegging some records <laughs> and he started putting stuff in. Yeah, For real? He putting stuff in. And then across the street. Well, he is R crazy. Yeah. <laughs> across the street, right directly across the street from crazy Eddie was R&R &R records. And they had all the breaks there. They had a lot of stuff there. So people would go over there and, and buy their stuff. But it was it wasn't a lot of places. Again, Burnside Avenue in the Bronx. They had a store over there that we used to always go to, and they had a lot of bootleg, twelve inches and stuff like that. And that's how we got it. Okay, so and 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 forgive me for asking a lot of pedestrian DJ questions, but I feel like you know a, a bird in the hand is two in the bush, and like that's you right. know you're you're the closest to to this era, so I can get all my questions out. Mm -hmm. So if okay, so. How old were you when you first started DJing, like your first block party, your your first party? Nine. Okay, so equipment wise, um, how are you transporting this? Like, how far from your house is the destination for which you're going to DJ the gig, and how do you get it there? Like, I know if you're a nine year old. You're not carrying one turntable at a time, one mixer at a time, the table. So, like, my how do you organize? My, my building was here. The Turtle Park was right up the street. You set up right in front of the Turtle Park. 
Done. And then across the street was my school, directly across the street from my house. I could look out my window, look in the schoolyard. John Peter Tate taught 143. We used to do parties up in there, dog up in there. Everybody just come grab the equipment, bring it up, bring it down the street. And that's how we did it. Plug it up to the pole. And we was out there all day. So and then how, we could go to other blocks. Two questions. One, how loud is the system? And was it loud enough to, for at least your preferences, uh, to rock a party area? Or was it just as loud as a, a radio boom box? Or my block first of all, was the main block everybody would come to because all the, it was just the fly dudes on the block. We just we just had a way of carrying ourselves on our block. So all the different areas would come. So whenever we was out there with the system, that shit was super loud and people would just know from Fordham, from Marble Hill, from Fort Independence, from Heath Avenue, from Bailey Avenue, University, they would just hear the music. They would just know. Then the word of mouth would get around too. You know, kid is rocking out there, they doing a block party, whatever, and next thing you know, the whole block is small. Okay. Yeah, it used to be some crazy. So my second question is, how are you protected? Like, you know, <laughs> as a nine-year-old, you're with turntables and a mixer and your records and whatnot. Is is there any situation of like a let's say a visiting <laughs> DJ from uh, uh Queens? Come first of all, are other boroughs allowed to come to your borough to to represent like as a Bronx child, are you allowed to go to Brooklyn to spend that block party or like, are you staying yeah. just where you know? No, I would go where, I was invited everywhere because I got, at, at a young age, early on, my name traveled real quick. So I would go anywhere. The problem was, but you could go anywhere, but if you wasn't good, you get your ass beat. So if like, if you come from the Bronx, you go to Brooklyn and you was not good, you may have a problem. If you don't, they love you. So it was, it was that type of thing. Has there? So I wanted to know: Has there been situations of like, oh, yo, we're 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 taking his turntables, or never ever? We're still not for you, but do you know of stories of like, ah, uh, man, he got his mix oh, jacked, yeah. or oh yeah, I've been to block parties where dudes got guns put, DJs got put guns put out. How are you protected from that action, and how often would that happen? It never happened to me because I was rolling. I had, you know, my dudes was gonna make sure I was all right. But I think right. I'm gonna tell you this um quest. Even to now, all the you know, all the try two hundred shows a year. Even as now, it's the I don't carry that aura that people wanted to do things to me, and you know, it was never like that. I never, I never went in other people's neighborhood and acted funny or you know treated people funny you know I, I just never did that so i never had that problem of yo what you doing here we gonna rob you or any of that i never had that energy but i always had people around me to make sure that i was straight you know what i'm saying and i never went places that i didn't i wasn't straight i mean I, i've been to some dangerous dangerous places but right I, I was always good but my energy make people feel a certain way so i don't really get that even the most gangsterous dudes you know well, okay. The the reason why I asked you this question because I I actually asked Dre this question, uh, you know, pre NWA where you know, and I you know I asked him about um. So if you remember the scene in Straight Outta Compton, where he is about to play um, Marvelettes, uh, please wait, Mister Postman, and he mixes it with Planet Rock, mm -hmm. and Dre explains to me like, yo. That was like such a risk for me to do because he was like, unlike those other parties, you know, like at any other party, they might give you one chance to spin a dud that they don't feel. And you might have 20 seconds to fix it. But, you know, Dre was explaining to me that he was spinning at a spot that was absolutely relentless and not forgiving at all for like the wrong record. So mm -hmm. for him to take such a risk, like he knew in order for him to make a mark, he had to take a risk. And it's like, mm -hmm. all right, I'm going to make them think I'm going to play some old Motown shit. Then they're going to get upset. Then when I have planet rock, they're going to be like, Oh shit. So he was like purposely saying that he had to lower expectations, but just fast enough to elevate them. So like, what space does that leave you? As a creative, you know, because, you know, I told you, as I explained at the top of the show, that um, you 
were big on like these these classic mixes of like mixing R and B with hip hop and uh, this acapella with that song and you know things that at least for you know maybe it was typical in New York, but I wasn't getting that in Philly. So like mm -hmm. you were the first tape DJ that we were that I was getting in the late eighties, early nineties, like when I was in high school, and whatnot. So how would you find the space to experiment to see if something works? Well, first, let me say this. I'm a fan. I'm a fan of great things. I'm a fan of good music. I'm a fan of good groups and just music, just everything about it. I'm a fan. When I, when I go to my shows and do my shows, I look at myself as a person in the crowd watching myself and how would I want to feel if I was that person watching me? What would make a promoter want to bring me back? What would make these people want to pay to come to see me again? I think like them. So with that, I like things that are good. I don't put a date on things. If it's good, it's good. And when it's good, it's timeless to me. And, and, and I could take something that will be unusual, nobody ever heard before, never heard it, um, don't know nothing about it, and make it sound like it's familiar. It's just the way, it's just the way it comes across. Keep in mind, Questlove, we DJs, anybody can play these records. Anybody can play these records. It's how you play. It's mm -hmm. the impact you give. I, I'm always an impact dude, a, a element of surprise. What's going to make it go to the next level? What's going to make these people feel better than they did before they seen me? What, you know what I'm saying? And how can I make them feel like they're never going to ever go to another event that's going to be better than this? They're never going to feel that feeling. That's my focus. So with that, I'll try certain things. Even if, you know, I was the one that started playing records and taking it off in the fourth bar. And the reason why I was doing that is because I had Def Comedy Jam television show and I was doing the, com the, the concerts and I only had a 15 minute set. So I had to play records quick. And I'm watching these people go into a frenzy every time I play this record quick. I throw one on, and if you pit, and if, if you don't throw the right one on after each other, you'll piss somebody off. So it has to be the right one that's going to make them forget that one that they like, that they want to hear that you're cutting off. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching these big crowds losing their mind to this, to this. So I applied it to the parties. And then I seen it working in the parties, and, you know, DJs followed that. But you don't need a whole lot. You, sometimes you play a record too long, it gets boring. Sometimes the hook is just the best part. Sometimes this, the count off is the best part. Sometimes the intro is the best part, and you can lean into something else. But that's building a continuity. That's build. That's that's painting a picture for people and kind of giving them a story from beginning to middle to end. Kind of telling a story. And I've had somebody tell me that he was like, "Yo, I see you. I've been to six of your shows. It's like you're trying to talk to us. It's like you're trying to tell us a story." And that's exactly right. what I'm doing. So if you play, I can play Sam for the Sun. Quincy Jones stamp of the sun. Boop, 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 right in the middle of the party. The way I play it make the crowd go crazy. But if I play it a different way, they'll look at me like, what the hell is he doing? Right. So it's all the way, it's all in the presentation. It's all how you deliver it. And I've been very lucky with that. What what year did, did you really start DJing? Like what's your actual like first year? 1976. Okay. So in in that period in which you're collecting records and 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 doing this what what was one of the what was the holy grail of of breaks or records that wasn't available or as prevalent as it is now for you back then like what was like oh my god i found it like even though i never used it like finding funky drummer on 45 meant something to me but I found Funky Drummer on 45, like, eh, what, like 10, 12 years ago, you know, like, oh, I never knew they made this on 45. And then I found a bunch of them. But for you, like, what was that record like? Oh, my God. Like, I can't wait to. What was the hardest record to acquire back then in your formative years? Lock it in the pocket. Yo, what is. OK. Can you explain to me? Like, as as a break mm -hmm. aficionado. And I get it. Like I've I've heard many of those mixtapes or, or cats rhyme over or whatever. I mean, at right now as I speak to you, um, I'm on a, a break uh rehearsing with LL. Mm -hmm. Even LL goes on to like, yo, we gotta do something to rock it in the pocket. We gotta do something to rock it in pocket. Like, what is it? And it's rocket in the pocket by Rocket in Sarone. Sarone. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah, Sarone is a uh, French drummer. Um, Rocket and Pocket is kind of like a, a a break of his. I don't know if this is a live album or not. There's a crowd in it. Yeah, it's a live, um, it's a live, a live record, and we had to put it on forty five. On forty five, I was about to it's say it was very record, slow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. What is it about that record? So when that album first came out back then, like all of y'all were going eight ship, like I gotta we get rocket in the pocket. I got damn mind when that. I remember it was a pool, a pool room. There was a pool room on Heath Avenue in the Bronx, and Louis came to the pool room. And they did this party in there, and Louis was DJing. He played Rock in the Pocket, man. It was like the whole room just stopped. Like, everybody was like, what the fuck is that? And he played it. He played he, it. Every time he cut it, people, you just seen the, it was just crazy. And then from that day on, that's the next time I heard it was with Cold Quest. But from that day on, Rock in the Pocket was like one of the top joints, and you couldn't find it nowhere. Because there was two Rock in the Pockets. There was the one, there was the studio Rock in the Pocket. Right. And then it was the live one. The live one is the one. So it was oh. hard to get that live one. So they bootlegged it. Ah. Right. I gotta admit, when when you spin it on 45, it sounds it sounds kind of kind of otherworldly because you know the the guitar is kind of on top of the snare, so it does it it sounds like some futuristic shit, which mm-hmm. you know, it's not like I, I it just sounds like a industrial breakbeat. So, okay, rock it in pocket. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, th- then since you started before, you know, I'll say that anyone outside of New York or really just outside of the culture, even though there's you know, one of the main questions I'm asked this year, especially is a lot of people that are just like, well, wait, I thought hip hop started in 1979, not 1973, you know, I, you got to explain that it builds up to 79 people consider you know okay when rappers like comes out then that's the you know the first national exposure to it what was what was your well one was king tim the third in your opinion w- was that a a pioneering moment for you guys or was it just sort of like shrug okay king tim the third no big deal and what was your reaction to Rapper's Delight? Like hearing what you, you're involved with on a local, kind of a local basis now being on a record. What was your reaction to it? Well, let me say this first of all. Bill Curtis from the Fat Bad Band is my uncle. Oh, wow. Oh, word. Yeah, he's my uncle. I just uh, I interviewed him recently on IG. He gave me some new, he gave me some two inches of uh, some of their old stuff from the '70s stuff. I ain't go through it yet. I just, I just did a record for him that's doing real good in London. And uh, in, in he New has York, his he masters. Yeah, yeah, I have his masters. I have him over here. And um, have Wiki Wacky. Yeah, I got. I, that's what I wanted to use. I wanted to do Wiki Wacky over. That's crazy. You said Wiki Wacky. <laughs> I wanted to do it over. Yo, <laughs> that's crazy. I did. I did it. I did the beat. I just didn't write the rhyme yet, but the beat is done. But no. um, that's crazy. He's I just came back. back from London. I didn't realize. I didn't realize. We just got back from London with the Chili Peppers, and I did a DJ gig. I didn't realize how much. I didn't realize that Wiki Wacky is a religion. And it wasn't until Giles Peterson reminded me that even on the song Maureen by Sade, she mentions like a good time in her life was her and her girlfriends uh dancing to wiki wacky in a nightclub. And I didn't realize that when I put that song on, it was like I put on smells like teen spirit back in the it's day. A big, like, it, it, yo, Bill, my uncle man, very talented. I, I produced a record for them recently called Bang Bang Bang. It's doing real good in Europe for them. It's doing real good as a matter of fact. And um, he's 90 years old, man. He's still going, like they still going strong. Crazy. Still going, still touring, still wow. traveling, still in the studio. Comes over here to my crib, everything. So he, he he's really moving. Um, but um, to answer Damn. your question, let's go back because people think hip hop started with rappers delight. Well, right. record started with rappers delight. Right, King Tim the Third was the personality job was the first rap record in our way of doing rap in our way of doing hip hop. But rap started way in the forties. The first rappers was the Jubilees, a group called the Jubilees. Four, 
for a uh, singer, gospel kind of singers, but they mm -hmm. rhyme just like a rapper. They, they, if you go and you listen to the, listen to go pull up their video on YouTube, they rhyme exactly with the bars, with the flow, with everything. It's it's amazing. And this is in the forties. The mm -hmm. first time a rap record was made was "Here Come the Judge" from Pygmy Markham. Pygmy Markham. Pygmy Markham. Markham was a comedian. He had his record "Here Come the Judge." Had the crazy hard beat to it. But James Brown was the one that gave the format of where hip hop was going to be. Mm -hmm. Pygmy Martin was a uh, Pygmy Martin was the first one to rhyme as a rapper, mm -hmm. as a, in a rap in a rap way on that right. type of music. So it was already here. What we're doing is just a remix. Now in our way, yes, Hertz came in seventy three and into this room and he's playing these these soul records, you know. And that was the beginning, but I remember being that young, watching everybody break dancing. At 73, 72, 73, 74, I remember watching people break dancing to Just Begun, uh, the James Brown, Clap Your Hands, and Fast Record Potential, records like that. This was back then. I, and, you know, I was a young kid watching this. So eventually it grew into when 79 came around, or 76 came around, 77 came around, and DJ started. All that was tied together, but it was st it started way before we even was even born. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that you know, black people it created so many things that got overlooked. You know, so many things that was pushed to the side, and this was mm -hmm. one of them. You know, it just it just took many more years for us to really catch on and make it prevalent. But it was going rap was going on since back then. What What do you consider? Um... Because you know, I, I in my eyes, I consider you like the first the first generation of uh, superstar DJs, where you know, just way past the pioneering stage of like where Flash and Bombada took it, like you as a product. But for you, like coming out the starting gate, I knew of you and I knew of Ron G. Mm -hmm. Like, but for you, who were the 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 main I mean, I, I don't want to say uh, uh, the forefathers of the superstar DJ eras where you're making mixtapes, where you're tearing up black colleges, where you're starting to get mainstream love on like television shows. Like who who do you consider? Who's the peer group of the superstar DJ era for you? Um, kind of a Mount Rushmore. Who, who would you consider? Well, as far as a Mount Rushmore, I would. I got to put Red Alert up there. I got to put Fair Master Flash up there. I got to put um, Charlie Chase up there. And the reason why I say these names, um, because, and her, of course, because they were the ones that was there first. They were the ones that, you know, I always say this, like I work with everybody, everybody. You see my BET performance, I put, I curated a whole BET show and my whole, Thing was to make to get across that the young and the old could party together and enjoy themselves, and mm -hmm. I think I hit that mark. But you know, my heroes is always the dudes that came before me, the dudes that didn't make the money I made or got the fame that I might have gotten or the accolades I've gotten. But they built it from the ground up. You know, um, a lot of times some of our some of our elder statesmen they get stuck in their old school way of thinking and they don't want to change. You know, saying it, it, it change is going to happen. I remember I had a, a, a talk with Herc one time, and I told Herc, I said, Yo, Herc, you know that it wasn't going to just stay in the Bronx. It was going to go worldwide, you know, because what happened was a lot of times we got selfish. We was in the Bronx. We made it. We wanted to stay there. Like, this was something that the world was going to take over. You know what I'm saying? So a lot of times the world could be harsh to the ones that helped build it. And it makes those people that help build it feel a certain way. So now when they say something, it looks like they're being old. It looks like they're mad at somebody. It looks like they bitter, you know. But what it is is that they feel like they didn't get fulfilled in the way that they think they should, you know. And that's why Hip Hop 50 is great because now it's no, it's a balance. It's everybody's being seen. Everybody's making money. Everybody is is being appreciated and the young dudes are seeing how important these older dudes were and are and what they've done in the path that they put for the younger dudes. But the older dudes got to understand that the younger dudes is going to change and do what they want and what's relevant to them and what they like. You don't have to like it, but you cannot. Things are going to change. 
What what year was your first uh, mixtape? The first, well, keep in mind, me and Star Child, Chief Rock and Star Child, me and him started making tapes together when I started playing in the SNS with him. And then after I left, after that year, a year, year and a half, I left. I, you know, I was doing my little parties, Studio Fifty Four and stuff like that, and I and I just said what I'm gonna do, and I went outside. You played the I, Studio Fifty Four? Absolutely. I, oh, I whoa! Tell 54. me what that shit's like. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Um. Red Alert. What happened was, Louis Vega, Larry Levan was playing Fridays and Saturday, but they had this Wednesday that Red Alert was doing. Red Alert was going on the road with BDP, so. He told the people at Studio 54, I want Kid Capri to be to take my spot. He was like, Kid Capri, who's that? We don't know him. Like, nah. He was like, yo, trust me, he's gonna do what he do. When I got there, you know, I turned it into pandemonium. But I was going on the regular and I was going on the club nights too. I would go hang out just to be there. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't believe I was playing Studio 54 and shit. But what I went year is this? My thing. I about to say, what year is this? Yeah. This was uh 87, 88, 87, 88, 89, around that time. Okay. And um, I brought Biz there. I brought, I brought all these different groups to Studio Fifty Four. For me, it was dope. It was it was crazy. And then it got so crazy that the crowds was just it, the crowds was too much. It, it, they were messing up the fruit stands, and I'm watching security open the door with people's heads, and I just say, you know what, let me just end this. But now after that, I said, what I'm gonna do? And I, I said, you know what, I'm just gonna sell my old mixtapes, and you know. So I went to Trader Horn and I bought a hundred mixtapes. And I copied tapes that I had and I made a new tape. And I would copy all these six, these uh six uh tape decks all night, staying up, tired, sitting in the hall. My equipment was in the hall. So you walk in the door, my equipment was right there at a one bedroom apartment. And I would sit there and make these tapes. And the next day I would go outside and sit there on the street corner and people would say, yo, $20 a kick a pre-tape. Who are you? Why would I give you $20 for a tape? I say, you'll listen to the intro of it in your car and you'll come back and buy everything I got guaranteed. They'll put it in the car, listen to it, come back. You'll get that, get that, get that. And next thing you know, my my tapes is in every car passing by. It's in the cop cars, in the Mr. Softy truck, people coming off the golf war. Mm-hmm. Yo, your tapes and cigarettes is the biggest thing. It became that. And then my parties became infectious. They, they seen how I performed. And I remember I was doing LL's party one time after he did the garden and, and Russell Simmons walked up and was like, yo, what do you think about being on a comedy show? I was like, comedy show? He's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, it's Russell Simmons, shut up, go do it. And we ended up doing it next to you know, I'm a superstar. I, I didn't even see it. I didn't even, I was, when we were doing the show, I wasn't even seeing that far. I'm not seeing that this is gonna be, I'm thinking we just doing something to have fun. You know, DJ with comedy show, that's it. Studio 54 in 87. I didn't even know Studio 54 was still around, 87. What mm-hmm. records were going off back then in, 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 in Studio 54? What were you playing? I was playing Public Enemy, playing oh, wow. uh, all the Kane records. Uh, so hip-hop was allowed? That right, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> hip-hop was allowed? Wow. After, that's what I'm saying. See, it was Larry LeBan and Louis, and Louis Vega. It was all a house. But Red Alert was so respected that they gave him that Wednesday. Okay. Like I said, he was going on a tour. He needed somebody to cover. He knew, you know, and that's when he got me. And when I came in, they seen a whole new different shit. They seen the line going around the building, down the street. Like, it was every time I came out, it was just pandemonium. And I had to leave it. I didn't want to leave. I had to leave because it got too dangerous. So, you know, I ended up, and, you know, and then for God, thank God, the day I said, uh, I remember I got... Biz Bismarck got me my first album deal. Right. So I'm, I'm up, I'm up in an office, and the lady, uh, Starlight, opened these four magazines and said, and said, Kick Capri, the only DJ in the world to make millions of dollars off of some mix, a street mixtape. I was like, wow. So I did it. I made. That's you know what? I didn't want no problems. She's not <laughs> you know People saying? knowing. <laughs> right. Right. Let me just let me just end it. And then I made the last doo wop disc tape, and that was it. And then, fortunately, my career, you know, went. Def Comedy Jam came, album came, tours came, and I was on, on my way. But okay. the next tape, had I not sat on that corner, because I got girls driving by laughing at me, Quest, like I'm doing bad, like I'm pedaling. Right. Driving yeah. by. I'm in Harlem. You know what I'm saying? Girls driving by. So I had to put 14 gold chains on my neck to look like I'm doing good, because I was feeling funny, <laughs> like I'm doing something wrong and shit. But me not having that pride, you know, um, 
willing to sit there and take that. It 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 was the right decision. Okay, so you went there, and I truly wanted to know how competitive is that marketplace when you, when you're on road trips and on tour, like you make your stop to your your local mom and pop spot. And you just buy all the mixtapes. And, you know, we just buying you and Doo-Wop and S&S mm -hmm. and all these cats. But, I mean, how heavy was the the territorial competi competition? Like, who was, who was your main competition then? I had no competition. When I well, landed, when I landed, everybody wanted to be Kid Capri. Everybody wanted to do it to this day. You see right. all these DJs, no disrespect, it's the truth. All these DJs do the Kid Capri. A lot of them, party DJs, they do the Kid Capri, the way they talk, the way they play the music, the way they look. You know, I made the DJ be an artist. I wanted to be looked at as an artist, not somebody just playing records. I wanted to be, when I get on that stage next to that dude that has a platinum album, like R. Kelly, I'm gonna make it hard for him to be on stage. Like that's what, that was my focus, not just being a DJ, playing records and people just looking at me like that. So that's why I took it that way. And my whole thing was I'm gonna be better than everybody. I'm going to give a show that they never seen. I'm going to make people feel like they never seen. So it caught on and it made DJs around the country that never spoke on the mic. Never a DJ that never played records quick or played those type of records. See me when I come in their city and they seeing this pandemonium going on, it made them do it. So this is the way you got to do it. And the promoters would tell them, yo, you got to do it the way Kid Capri do it. And those promoters, those DJs would say, yo, I'm a top DJ out here. Why do you get Kid Capri to come in town? Shut up, mm -hmm. shut up and sit there and watch and look. And, and, and pay attention. Where does that come from? Because for me, I just started talking <laughs> maybe in 2020. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even now in 2023, I think I've waned off 40%. Like, all right, the mm -hmm. pandemic's over. I don't have to talk as much. Like, mm -hmm. I'll talk my ass off on Zoom. Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, when I'm DJing right. online. But you, you have this, like, bull in a china shop energy you know you know and you where does that come from because i feel like one of the one of the hardest battles even with without the music is maintaining getting the respect that of a school bully like you're grabbing people by the collar when you're addressing them not like hey guys how you doing today so i'm kick capri and uh I'm gonna play some records and i hope you enjoy it like you're not that guy like so where does that come from where do you learn that from it's a, it's a, like I told you, I'm a fan of it. So it's a certain amount of, keep in mind, we're looked at as DJs that just play, DJs looked at as somebody just play records. What's going to make me any more special than anybody else? Right? So I got to add something that means something that's going to make people say, oh, wait a minute, this is different. Not only that, it's just a feeling in me. Look, I had surgery recently. Right after I did the BT Awards, I had surgery. They took my thyroid out. Oh. Right? Right. I had shows booked that I couldn't cancel. I didn't cancel the show. And I told the promoters, y'all, I'm not going to really speak on the mic like that while I'm on stage, you know. But then I get on there, and it's a different thing. It's a feeling that I get that I want people to feel. So it comes with me screaming it. It's like, I can't really explain it. It's like I gotta scream it out. I gotta, especially when it's at that point where I know these people are gonna go so crazy. How can I make them even go that much more crazy in that instant? And it's my voice. Yo, a question about your voice. Is that your voice on Party Groove, Showbiz and AG? Yeah, that hey, was a big that was, what are you that saying? Was, <laughs> yeah, that what are you saying? Big, Stretch and bin. I thought you, you gave me yoga live, instructions. That was a live show that I did in the powerhouse where they made the juice movie at. Okay. That's the reason why they made the juice movie there because I made the powerhouse hot downtown. Gotcha. And on the tape, I would do, I would make the P like I would say, do the bin and stretch, keep it going, do the bin and stretch uh. and as we go bin. I'm making people dance, bend and stretch in the party, in the club. Wow, so, okay. So I thought you were doing bin, Pilates. Right, right. <laughs> So Showbiz sampled the mixtape yeah, and yeah. put it on the record, and it became the first party groove record. 
And so, and what's the quote again? What did you stretch? What's the quote again? Say it again. It's bend and stretch. Keep it going. Do the bend and stretch. And as you ride, we go bend and stretch. That's all I'm saying. Wow. But everybody around the world says, yo, kid, what are you saying? I, but it caught it, the way it sounds made it, you know, when something sounds good, it is good as James Brown was right. saying. So, so they didn't know what I was saying, but it sounded good. So it that's is, why yeah. it stuck. I thought you were talking about Bismarck. My, my record Uptown with my daughter that's on my on my album The Love that's out now. I did it again. I did the bend and stretch on the end of that record. So it's 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 a and now the um Zumba uses that record in their Zumba uh exercises. It's crazy. They sent me a video with the whole Zumba class, big Zumba class dances the uptown. So that wow. bend and stretch definitely worked out. <laughs> James and two made bookers is it big bigger thing. Oh, uh, dude! Yeah, why? What was <laughs> when we when we interviewed him? <laughs> God, yeah, rest in peace. God rest his soul. Yo, yeah. what was it? Because the thing is, now I get it. First of all, did you produce that on on Grand Poopa's record? Yeah, of course you did. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm I'm trying to do the math in my head because even when I got the record. I'm like, would I listen to to, to this soundtrack <laughs> to even know that this? And it's so unusual. It's a very unusual yeah. break that is not. It's not a. It's it's it's, it's not, not an organic or break. Substitution, yeah. It's, yeah, it's such a weird. So it works, but even then, I was just like, wait a minute, why would he sample that? What what is your relationship to to bigger theme? Uh, it was just a dope joint that I think I heard Brucey had played it one time. Brucey B? I think, no, I, no, it was. Yeah, I think I heard Brucey had played it with Rakim. Damn, where did I hear that at? I, heard, I think I Bruce, Brucey played it. And, you know, we would take, like, all right, perfect example, like Mr. Mean, Foster Silver. That record was mm -hmm. made in 1972. The record was over there with. Made it hot. Made rise to the top. Uh, you know, all these records that was over. As a matter of fact, take six. I put I put spread love, spread love. Spread love. Yes, on that tape. And take six in 2022, in 2020, reached out to me. Kid, you put our tape. We said they said, um, he said, yo, we made that record for the gospel people. You put that record on your tape and put us on the worldwide tour. So we want you to remix the song. I did a remix of Spread Love with Take Six in 2020. It's wow. called Spread Love 2020. This shit is crazy. The beats, right. the drums right. is crazy. Everything. So they 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 were so they had so much gratitude for me putting it on there that they came back and asked me to produce it. I was so happy for that. But Wait, you're the one that's responsible for that. Spread love mixed with the uh, Ike and Tina Turner break under it. No, that's forty five king. I did okay. the real remix for oh, the real joint. Okay, okay, okay. Right, yeah. So, um, but, but, keep in mind that record, that it it really had nothing to do with what else was on the tape. It was like everything else on the tape was so far away from everything else. But that's what I'm trying to say. I go by what is hot what is good and it doesn't have to make sense it'll make sense after i make it make sense i think like that like it don't happen if you listen to my show on serious sex and fly the block party you'll hear young and me and hear al green after you'll hear you know what i'm saying like you never know what you're going to hear and that's what makes it so so great Open format dj yeah yeah there you go you know you're you're like the king of the mashup to me so what do you consider like the the mix that like the first time he did it the entire crowd went ape shit like what the fuck is that we could go as we go up to something in the way you make me feel with the impeach the president that changed the whole R and B game now you had to make record with R and B records with breakbeats that's how Mary and all these things came about because nobody heard it that way before you know what I'm saying and it just changed the whole game so that was one of the things but there's so many things. It's yeah, and so she, uh, things, you know, let me just let our listeners know that yes, both Eddie and Mary credit you when they heard that Stephanie Mills, something the way you make me feel a cappella, which is unusual to be on a 12 inch, like you know, the idea of the, of an RB a cappella, 
at that time. Right. Very unusual. Um, so instantly, I, you know, where sparks going in your head, like, yo, what the hell? Like, I can do anything with this or. The, 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 the full circle was when me and Stephanie did it live. I remember you came with me. You said, OK, that was real hip hop. Tell that like story it. of how you got Stephanie to do it with you. Right. What happened was I've been doing Indiana Black Expo with Ab Harris, the promoter, for 20 something years. Okay. Every year. Ab Harris now uh, manages Stephanie Mills. Mm -hmm. So I was doing a show for him out there in Indiana. He told Stephanie Mills the story about what I did with the, with the record. And he had her come to Indiana without me knowing. So I was on stage. She was right there. And he said, yo, little Steph. I brought Steph out here for you. I was like, what are you talking about? She came out. I never met her. She didn't know nothing about what was going on until we told her. She had this big shit. Her record, she knew what her record was to her. But in the street, she had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. So when we did it then, it wasn't rehearsed. Like I said, I never met her. It was my first time meeting her. And we did that shit on the spot. And if you remember... She was going to keep going, and I stopped. I said, oh, that's it. That's all I need. I'm good. I felt like me stopping her and it being short would make more of an impact than me having to do the whole thing. That's just the way I thought at the time. But just her being there with me and 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 seeing a visual, when I touched your heart, I knew I did something. When you when you rolled up on me in Jazzy Jeff's crib, you was like, okay, that right there. <laughs> when you said that, I was like, yeah. I, I did something. No, that was a moment. Quest I was don't like, really wow. Say too much. Quest, Quest, Quest is reserved. You don't say too much. You know, you know. So if he say something, it's like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about stuff. <laughs> 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 I'm excited about stuff. Like, have you ever met a marketplace in which they're like, like down south, for instance? Nope. Really? Every crowd I get into, I rip it down. That's what I do, no matter where it's at, no matter what what the situation is, because my whole attitude was know what's going on in that city. That city don't care about what's going on in New York. They care about what's going on in that city. So find a DJ that's there, find out what's going on. And when he, when he tells you what's going on, you know what's going on, bring that DJ out, show the respect to that DJ, put him on stage and let everybody know this is just this, this city's DJ. You know what I'm saying? You're a guest in their house. And with that, all the information from different places would come to me. I would stay on top of what's going on over here, what's going on with this side of the country. I would, it was just the way I did things. And with me doing that, with me going to experience it and do it, it made me learn how to stay, do it everywhere else. So I never had a, got booed, never a crowd walked out on me, never been a thing where people wasn't happy or somebody said some crazy shit in the, in the crowd or threw something at me, never been none of that. It always been people happy. And I'm blessed. I'm very happy for that. I'm very blessed in that way for that to happen. Because, I, like I said, I'm a fan of it. And I know how I want to feel. If I pay my money, I got to drive to get there if I have a car. I got to buy clothes to wear once I, to, to, to be there. I got to pay to get in. I got to buy drinks. If somebody's there, I got to buy them a drink. And I'm all yeah, I might have had to hire a babysitter reasons. or something, too. Like, you know right. what I mean? I got to get a babysitter. All these yeah. different things I got to do because kicking priests in the building. How do I not get the best I can get? You know what I'm saying? Like, I think like that. And then there's a reversal way. People don't think about what you had to do to get to the event. If you had traffic, lost your bags, you know, did you eat? Are you sick? Do you feel? You know, all they know right. is the end result. I want I want my show. I want what I paid for. I pay for that. They don't know nothing. So it works both ways. There was there was a moment in 2000. There was a moment in 2005. In which for the very first time I played the horn intro to Troy. And I didn't get that scream. Yeah. Like, you know what happens like, when you play that intro? When mm -hmm. you used to play the intro, to, like the choice is yours. Mm -hmm. And the place like... And, you know, for the longest, like one of my signature things would be like play Troy right after like scenario. Who's that mm -hmm. brown? And the place mm -hmm. like start high five and crying and hugging. Mm -hmm. And there was a moment where that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shit, I got to adjust and adjust. Like I never had a quiet Troy moment in my life. How long did it take you to 
really truly adjust to being an open format DJ and like embrace things because you know as as open-minded as I would like our listeners to think I am you know and I've, I've explained this before on the show that you know as as an individual course we we know that we have our opinions of what good music is and what bad music is but then mm-hmm. as a DJ I have opinions on what is effective for my DJ set and not effective for my DJ set and oftentimes with those four things good bad effective and non-effective like what's effective for my DJ sets now is stuff that I personally wouldn't listen to, but I know works for my set. Right. And so, you know, there was like maybe a year or two where I just wrestled with, ah, damn, do I just, or do I just like fight and only play to my audience? Like how long did it take you to just start adjusting to a new atmosphere and new generations? There's plenty of records I hate that I play that I don't like. <laughs> but it's not about me. You know what I'm saying? It's 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 about that that room. And you know, so that right there automatically makes you know that you have to step out of your own personal feeling and adjust to what they want because that's the end result. A lot of D, a lot of DJs sometimes they uh miss the mark because they feel like they don't like this record. So it shouldn't be played, you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, I, like I said, there's stuff that I might play that I don't, I don't really care for much to, but I see, but I'll see a crowd go crazy to it and it'll make me like it. I may not even like the song at first, but once I see a crowd lose it, lose it to it, it'll make me say, all right, well, I could adjust to it all. You know, it'll make me like it in some kind of all way, right. but let me ask you. And I'll, I'll let's use an example from 25 years ago, so you don't have to be like now, like, oh okay. man, fuck Ice Spice or whatever. I don't know. But <laughs> is, is there an album that is? Is there a song that you acknowledge as a classic now? That maybe 25 years ago you were like, uh, I'm not feeling this. Like it took you long to like adjust to it. Biggie, Biggie, Biggie. You didn't like hypnotize. <laughs> Loved it. I hated the hook. You didn't think it was a smart hook? I hated the hook at first. At first, I couldn't stand the hook. Biggie, biggie, biggie. I just couldn't stand. I just didn't like it. But the record was dope. The loop, you know, the, the, you know. Right. You know, okay. The, the record was dope. So it made, then after you, I guess you hear it a certain way, then you start like, but then after a while, I was like, all right, yeah. But at first, it was like, damn, I should have did a different hook. But I was wrong. It was you effective. Know? It was effective, you know. And, it was and sometimes, effective. And, and, and a lot of times, I guess what's going to be a hit, but you know, I'm not a robot. Sometimes I'll miss, you know what I'm saying? Or you know, I don't like missing, but sometimes I'll miss. And, you know, <laughs> it, be, it be what it is, you know. Um, but and then there's wow. a lot of that, you know, the, me and you would have never made a Laffy Taffy beat. We would have never wrote that. Not that it's bad for them. We would have never did that. We would have probably I, passed up on it, but look, I I fronted on Laffy Taffy for its initial run, <laughs> right? And it's a classic now. <laughs> I dude, when I I was gonna say, I played Laffy Taffy the the first time I did the Gold Party for the Carters. I was like, all right, let me reach into my Southern bag, my my second generation Southern bag that I would have otherwise ignored on my own gigs, right? And just the way that they were going ape shit about it, I was like, yes. "Yo, I, I was Laffy wrong." Taffy. Like, I, if I play Laffy Taffy, uh, the Snap Records, they lose their goddamn mind. It don't matter what age it is. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because it, it was just that time and moment. You know what I'm saying? And most dance records like that, watered down records for some reason, it just works. Well, you went there briefly, um, but uh, of course, you're you're tenure with i mean would you consider yourself a juice crew member or no okay no, i was just saw cold chilling biz uh got me granddaddy i you and business brother Don shell a production uh he had a production deal okay. and it was crazy because when biz got me that deal, I, I wasn't even looking for album deal. i wasn't even thinking about album deal. and i remember i was leaving studio 54 biz pulled up on me in the car right on the corner he said okay we'll get you out there i said shut up biz 
Shut up. Come on. <laughs> so then one day he came in, they see me on Rucker. Oh, matter of fact, the day that he was going, he brought, he pulled up on me at Rucker. He said, okay, oh, come here. Come here. I got to show you something. And he played, <laughs> you got what I said, Biz, you bugging. You really going to put this out? That's what I said to him. You really going to put this out? He was like, watch, watch. And he put the record out. We on tour. We was going. <laughs> Crowds losing their bodies. I was like, yo, this can pull it off. And it worked. And um, he got me my deal. Like I said, I didn't even want no deal. He got me the deal because I was hot in the street. He could have gave that deal to anybody else that was a real rapper. You know, so I was robbing on the record, on the tapes, and I wasn't trying to be a rapper. Though. Like, even with my album out right now, Rob, I'm not trying to be a rapper on stage. I just want yeah. to put music in the world. But at the time, you know, he could have gave that to somebody that really, really was good. You know what I'm saying? But he, he, you know, he really gave it to me, and I'm always going to be a debtor to that. I really appreciated that, you know? Have, have you, yes. have you uh, DJed for, a, I, I don't want to say a pedestrian rapper, but, I mean, I know you are Kid Capri, like, you DJ your own, but have you done any any tenures with like an MC that needs like I know a few times like Biggie will go back and forth on DJs and whatnot, but uh have, have, Joint was me and Rock Kim did this tour. Oh, okay. This was a crazy tour me and Rock Kim did. Uh when I went on tour with Salt and Pepper. That's uh, right. You were tour. DJ with Salt yeah, Pepper. I DJ for Salt Pepper. I DJ for Kid and Play. The very first tour, the public get to be uh greatest world, uh greatest hip hop show tour. It was thirteen groups on that tour. I was helping them on that. Um, but I never really played behind a lot of people. KRS One, of course. Um, but not really a whole lot of people because people always looked at me as a one man band. And, oh, man. I guess. I guess that's what it is. I guess the perception is that he, he don't want to play for nobody behind, you know, if behind nobody. Um, so, but yeah, but RBRM, when I went on tour with them, I didn't play behind them, but I went on tour with them, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But Jennifer Lopez, she wanted me behind her. Like, there's a lot of people that reached out. It just didn't work out because of timing. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. I thought, yeah, okay. I, I'll be honest with you, I felt like if me and Kendrick Lamar would have went on tour together, you know, the Pulitzer Award album, he put me on there. It's the only hip hop album that won the Pulitzer Award. I'm deeply grateful. He put me in voice. He put my voices in places around the country I've never been to. So I'm deeply grateful for that. Uh, grateful for that, and, and love the fact that he did that. And when I was in the studio with him, I asked him. I said, "Yo, you could have got DJ Battle Cat or you know DJ Pooh. These dudes are legends. You could have got them on the album. They West Coast, you know." He was like, "Yo, I love the dudes and everything." He was like, "But I know what you did for the music business. I know what you did for DJs. I know what you did. I wanted that authenticity on this album." I was like, "Wow, he really knew what it was." So I didn't have to really explain that he he really got it, and he put me on that album. And how it, crazy it, was the it, effect afterwards? Amazing, man! I couldn't believe it. It was like, it was crazy, you know. And keep in mind, he brought me to. There might be kids that don't know about Kid Capri. Never had right. the Kid Capri experience, don't know nothing about me. He brought me to those people. You know what I'm saying? Like I said, he put my voices in countries I've never been to. It's the Pulitzer album. Like it never, it, no other, no other hip hop album ever in history. This is a, a milestone. So yeah, Pulitzer like Prize. I said, I yes. wish he could have did so much more, like going on tour with each other. And it would he didn't need me, of course, because you know he is what he did with Dick, but it would have been me and him together. Just doing certain things, it would have been, it would have been special. So, but like I say, he's already special. So, it was all good. But I, I was up. very happy about that. Um, can you talk about your transition into the production game? Um, well, you did this joint. You flipped the you flipped the good times joint for Slick Rick. I no, I the didn't. Name of the joint. No, I did the original. I did the original version, and then Track Masters did that version. <clears throat> They did the, okay. uh, that was Unified, Unified Remix. Right. But I was okay. always making beats. My first album that Biz got me, it says Biz Production, Biz Producer, but I produced the album, being cool me. And then I produced the soundtrack to Streets album with Jay and Buster like Rob yeah. and Oz and all of them. Yeah. I did that whole album. And then I just did this album, uh, that the Love album. The Love album, in the pandemic, I'm seeing a lot of shit, just stuff that I, was, mm -hmm. I didn't agree with. I said, you know what, let me just do something different. And I won't slap key. And came out good. I recorded it. And God put his glove on my head on my shoulder and said, keep going. So I just ended up doing the album. I put Slack Key out. And had it not got the response I wanted, the album would have never seen the light of day. 
but it was good response. And I put the album out, great response. I have a guy one complain about it. A lot of different artists, Snoop, and different people will call me, congratulate me. Nobody's seen this coming because I'm robbing on it. My last album was 24 years ago. You know, music business is different. I had everything against me with this album, but I didn't, I didn't care about that. I just wanted to put it out. And, you know, it, it worked out. But, um, yeah, it's got to keep going with it. I wanted to ask you uh, particularly about Nothing But Love, Heavy D. Uh, do you yeah. remember, what do you remember about that session um, working with him? Nothing But Love was a different beat. And when we were in the studio, it, it I just didn't, it didn't match what I was trying to do with him. So I changed it and I went in my bag and pulled out the end games and put the end games on it. Bam, 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 put it out there and right. the drums. And then he caught writer's block and he couldn't write. He couldn't write. So this, so I wrote the half. I wrote half of the second verse, and I wrote. I'm sorry, I wrote the half of the second verse, and I wrote half of the last verse. No, I wrote the last verse. I wrote half of the second verse, and I wrote the the last verse. And then we ended up doing the record. And then the CCNY tragedy happened, where the nine people died. One of my friends, Jewel, he was one of the people that passed away. You were there. No, my daughter's mother. She was there. She was pulling okay. bodies out. She pulled Father MC's daughter's mother. A uh, father MC's girl who was pregnant at the time, and she passed away. She pulled her out. Oh no! Uh, yeah, you, my friend. He was the only dude. There was only there's only two castles in New York. One in Yonkers, one on my block. And my block, Kings with Terrace, is where they made the movie The Wanderers at. So mm -hmm. if you look, if you watch, watch the movie The Wanderers, you'll see my block, the Long King of Terrace. This castle he lived in. He was 25 years old, never had sex. He was waiting till he had a, uh, a wife before he had sex. And he was killed in this CCNY thing. And I remember Heavy D had a show at the garden. And he was, because he had something to do with the event. He just wasn't there, but he was one of the promoters. And he mm -hmm. explained it. He was like, yo, I'm not going to take responsibility, but I feel bad of what happened to everybody. But I got nothing but love for the crowd. And he dropped nothing but love. And the crowd lost their goddamn. I was standing right mm -hmm. next to him. On the stage, the crowd lost it. That's what I do. I gave him his last hit, his, a, a, a big hit. That was his biggest, that was his last hit record before he passed away. Damn. I didn't yep. even know you did that. Damn, that's crazy. Yep. Yep. Because yep. the first time I saw you spin, you would come to the event with like at least eight crates. It's and the, the level. Yep that I've never seen the dizzying level of how you would organize records or whatever. Yeah. That's why when Jeff, Jazzy Jeff, would try to convince me to be on Serato. And I was so- How hard was I, it to make that transition? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I like the fact that I have 15 crates and I would run to the crate and catch a record at the last second and drop the needle and it just looked crazy to the crowd. So I thought if I got rid of that and went to the computer, it wouldn't be that same excitement. And Jeff will always say, okay, you got to go on the computer. You got to do, you know what I'm saying, Serato shit. All right. Boom. So then Def so, so you were late to the Serato game? Oh, yeah. Okay, I ain't started Serato game since 2006. So Def Comedy Jam wow. came around, came back, and Mike Epps was hosting it. And they asked me if I would produce the beats on Def Comedy Jam because they didn't want to clear the Def Jam records. Right. So I produced all the beats. Now, how do I play it? Put it in Serato. Right. So I put the beats in Serato, and I did the show. Then I started putting the break beats in Serato. Now I put the, the reggae records, and I put the old school reggae. Next thing you know, everything was in Serato. Got rid of the records. Now it was good. And then I see the crowds in, in my show still reacting the same way when I had the records. So I was good. I, I was going to say, how irksome is it for you to watch any of the uh, retro Def Comedy Jam shows. And like, for me, the best part of the show is when you start doing the LL breakdown thing. <laughs> and, you know, of course, when it came on DVD and now that it's streaming and even on YouTube, you know, they put like interstitial music over it. Like, so you're trying to imagine what they're dancing I, to. I can't stand it. I hate it. I hate it, but it, it's the it's it's the clearances, it's the money. They you know it's a lot of money to yeah, those records. And you would think that they Def Jam records 
it would be all right for Def Comedy Jam to play, but I, I thought that way. It don't go that way. It's whoever owns the publisher, you know, you got to go through all that shit. And then some people are just greedy. Some people want what they want, and they don't see the bigger picture. So to eliminate it, I, I was making the beats and you know, got around it. Yeah, I was going to say there's there's one comedian that I I if I recall correctly, like he made you part of the act. Um, this brother named uh, Talent. Yeah, the talent. Dude that you saw. It's just comedy. Yeah. That talent guy. Crazy. But talent would do this thing where he would have a scenario and needed a soundtrack to it, and he would have you play the record. Yeah. And then he would do the scenario. All right, we want, we want, kicker. All right, now this scenario is blah blah blah, and I can never find. And it's a, one of the funniest things ever. And I wish I could find that original, but because of music clearance issues, you know, people don't get I to see it. So much footage from us on the road, me and Bernie, Bernie was like my uncle. Bernie Mac was like my uncle. Like mm -hmm. me and him, like, like this, like, so I got so much footage of, of, of me and him and Bill Bellamy and Chris Tucker and Eddie Griffin, all of us, man, just on the road and just different funny things, man. This dude, Bernie Mac, man, was funny all day long, man, just all day. Really? This dude will be on the tour bus. He'll wake up to put a stocking cap on and he'll have you laughing, just laughing all the way until it's time to do the show. Then he'll go and host the show, tear that down, get back on the tour bus, put the Scott and Cap on with the Heineken, and have you laugh until you fall asleep. And then he messes with the bus driver, just where the bus driver got pulled over, because he laughing his ass off. This dude was just <laughs> that all day. You just look at him and just laugh. He just, it was amazing in that way. It was, um, you know, he was one of them dudes. It was sad to see him go, too. Yeah. You know, um, yeah. but all them, all those, everybody that I toured with, everybody that was on that show, they're all my extended family, man. We all did something. We did something great together. You know what I'm saying? And and it really touched people. Like every time we sold out somewhere, you just see the people just smiling and happy. And you know that that was that was the most thing for me. How many how how much good times? It was never a threat where you had to worry about crime going on or somebody getting hurt, a shot or a fight breaking mm -hmm. out. It was always fun laughing and. It was dope. It was dope. Yeah. I was gonna ask you about uh just uh the master of the mix, man. Um I I'm, it was a while back, but uh I really mm -hmm. enjoyed that show. And uh I wanna just ask you about just kind of what that experience was like getting acting, I guess, as a as a judge and judging other other DJs, man. How was that mm -hmm. experience? It was dope. Um I was almost like the cyber cow. I was very serious. I was very, <laughs> right, mm -hmm. right. very yep. serious. Yep. Straight up. Because I had to worry about my, the reason why I was so serious was because I had to worry about my credentials. I had to worry about, you know, not my credentials. I had to worry about if I was coming off with the truth. I wanted to be truthful. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to show no favoritism. I didn't want to show like I didn't know what I was talking about or, you know, any of that. I wanted to be what it was. And, and, and it worked out. We was on for two seasons on BET and then we was on one season on VH1. My, I, me personally, I think they should have kept that show going. You know, I know what issues they have, but I, they should have kept that show going because what it did, you have dudes like Mel Starr that you see right now. Had Mel Starr not been on that show, we don't know if we would have seen him as quick as we did, but because he was on that show and he's super talented. So that show got a chance to, to you know, show the world who these dudes are. The same way in Def Comedy Jam. Remember, before Def Comedy Jam was Richard Pryor, Red Fox, Eddie Murphy, yeah. you know, a couple other dudes sprinkled here, but comedy, you if you didn't wasn't them dudes, you ain't, you know. So when we got that comedy jam, we display all this plethora of all these different people. Now it, it became bigger. And that's the same thing with, with Master the Mix. It was all these different DJs, Chris Card and you know, JCO, all these dudes do arenas now, you know what I'm saying? Because of that show being on that show. So it was definitely a dope show. They definitely should have kept it. They, some things I would have changed around. I'd have changed some things around that I didn't think that I didn't really agree with. Yeah. But, you know, it is what it is. And then I was on another show. Did you know I was on uh, Growing Up Hip Hop? I missed that one. Nah, nah. What did was not know. My daughter. And I did that because of my oh, daughter. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, okay. but I only did one season. I only did one season and I was out. I, I, I'm not the reality TV. Now, speaking of which, uh, talk about uh, Vina. First of all, I, I'm surprised we got through this whole episode without any jokes of me uh, taking your last name. Love is actually your last name, correct? My real last name. That's why the name of the album is called The Love. Of course. The yeah, Love. Yeah, well, talk talk about what it's like, like collaborating with your daughter and, and now that she has, has 
you know, planted her seeds and, and, and is starting her story right now. Like what, what is that? What is that like for you to see her carrying on the legacy? At first, you know, I know the music business. I know yep. what's in the music business. I know everything. And normally, you don't want your kid in that. You know what I'm saying? You don't want them to go through certain things. Right? Mm -hmm. But the way she grew up, how she, what she showed me, how she handled herself, how she do things, she has the skin for it. Now, did she have the talent for it? didn't know and I wasn't going to push her off on people just because she's my daughter. She had to prove to me that she really could do her thing and she came to me with this record where she did Maya's Best of Me over with her little boyfriend at the time and the record was dope but then she did a record that she wrote for Rihanna called Air that mm -hmm. never got to Rihanna and she ended up recording it herself and that's when one I was like okay she's ready and from there on she been moving there but how she carry herself how she treat people, the smile she keep on her face, how she talk the way she look at stuff, she's just like me. She is, she she respects what it is, and then she see how her father moved. That's another thing. She see how her father moved, how different people treat me, you know, and it make it it automatically molds your child when they see it, when they're around the experience. If they're always home and they're not around to see things, then they're gonna go with what they go with. But when they get a chance to really see everything it kind of molds them. And that's what happens. She really knows what she's doing. And she's talented. She really works hard. It's more of the talent. She really, really works hard. You know, and I just want her to really just be happy in, in, in it. And all she's happy, that's it. You know, um, this music business, like I said, if you let it get to you, it will. You know, and um, sometimes things don't work out the way you want, when you want it to work out. You know, and that's a part of the growing. That's a part of, the, that's a part of appreciating the journey, you know. What's up? Right. I always wanted to ask you one of my favorite intros of all time to an album is uh of Sex and Violence, BDP. Mm -hmm. You remember yeah. like where y'all was y'all recorded that or you recorded it? <laughs> right. Oh, with the record. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where, I always where, thought y'all did that on purpose to make it like that's how parties are. <laughs> like what, the I, wait, what was it? The be oh, at the beginning of the album, yeah. The, it's the, um, very, the very first joint with him and Freddie Fox. Yeah, uh, yeah, nice yeah that's what I do. Right. Yeah. I was on that. I wasn't on that. Nah, you on that. At the end, you said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, give it off for my motherfucking man. Whoops. And, and the record skips. The record stops. It's like, oh, y'all know where they come from. They come from blowing up on the parties and all that, right? My people. I had to go back and listen to that. I forgot about that. Yeah, too. The best part of the show. And then it goes right into. <laughs> it goes to duck down. I forgot so. about that. I got to go back and check that. And I know it's a cliche to ask, but like, you know, being as though this is hip hop's 50th year, and Jeff always jokes with me that no one's going to celebrate the 51st, so we got to celebrate it now. Yeah. For you, um, you know, is there is there anything that you you've yet to check off in 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 your bucket list that you haven't achieved yet? Like, yes. you know, what would you like to see the culture go, or for you to do, or or do you just you know want to stop and chill and you know? Well, I tell I tell you this, I've been had I've been had um, nothing to prove. I've been reach that level have nothing to prove no more because I did a lot of different things, created a lot of opportunities for different people. And, you know, I really, really did my thing. But when I did the BET Awards and I was able to show that, that's that's really, that's it. That's the cap on it. The one thing I haven't got a chance to do, as many things as I did, was sell a platinum album or sell a gold album. You know, um, I only had three albums in my career. Making records never been my bread and butter. I do it because I want to do it. You know what I'm saying? But I the, the Love album, it has so many layers to it. My mother's on the front cover with the big afro. My daughter's on the, on the record. I produced everything, wrote everything. I didn't run to any artist that's hot and say, yo, come get on my shit to sell it or none of that. I did everything myself. There's so many layers to it. You know, and... And I didn't put it out for it to go platinum or gold. I put it out to put something in the world. But I would like to see it really do good. I would like to see the world hear this album and really, you know what I'm saying, and, and just absorb it because I haven't got a bad complaint one time since I put it out. You know, the internet, 
they're going to say whatever they want. I haven't <laughs> got one of those yet. Not one. You know what I'm saying? So with that being said, the frustrating part for me is that I know everybody hasn't heard it. I know everybody don't know it's there. There's people that cover me right now. Yo, I remember when you had your, your, your two albums out. You didn't hear the third one? Like, it, it, you know, so that's how I know. It's like, you know, that's the frustrating part. But See, I only know because I follow you on IG and during the pandemic, you know, you didn't even know I was in the room watching you in the studio making your beats and as you were making the record and whatnot. So, you know, yeah. it's it's finally good to, to to see the fruition of it. Your mom actually has a humongous afro, yo. Like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> she was definitely, definitely big on her, all her. And her last name is Love. I might be a long lost cousin. I don't know. <laughs> you might be. Make a connection. <laughs> exactly. No, brother. Thank you, man. I, you know, I, I got to see very briefly at the at uh, LL's Rock the Bells Festival, which was really like a, a, a kind of amazing family reunion, like to be backstage and literally every like there's there's the, there's an era of hip hop that I've yet to meet. So, you know, to be backstage and you're seeing like the Fearless Four and and the Fantastic Romantic Five and the Cold Crush Brothers and crazy. Yeah, it was just and, like and a, we're about to experience again because I'm about to do Yankee Stadium for the second time. Uh the eleventh, the hip hop day. Uh the Yankee Stadium, me, Snoop. Who's on that Nas. show? Me, Snoop, Nas, Wiz Khalifa, Run DMC, Fat Joe, Ace Boogie. <sighs> whole bunch of other people. So hip hop's just and, um, coming to the Bronx. It coming to the hometown. We come to the hometown and smash it down. The first time I did Yankee Stadium was when I did it for Nelson Mandela when he came out of jail. And they did right. a, a, okay. a celebration for me. Yankee Stadium me and KRS went and did it. And that was a that was a milestone. So we back again and I'm gonna come in, uh just do my thing. I'm I'm gonna pull off something special too. When I pull out this thing that I'm gonna pull out, it's gonna shake the room. So I'm hoping that goes, yeah I got, got something got something special. But it's gonna be dope. Thank you, Stadium. Home, man. I can't wait. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Kid Capri on Quest Love Supreme. Um, thank you, man, for everything. Thank you, um, thank you, man. Straight up. You know, you you your your tapes have entertained me. I've seen you many times, like rock shows. I've took notes. Um, and you know, you've been nothing but but genuine and, and really, really kind and, and and dope to me. Any nerdy questions I had over yeah. the years, you've answered them. And I thank you for that. Um yeah. I and thank you for doing our show, man. Yeah, thank you I, for I, was, me, man. I got a chance to see you. Uh, this was in Toronto some years back. Uh, we were opening and I for opening uh, for you and Rakim. You were spinning for mm -hmm. Rakim in Toronto. And, yes, uh, sir. The best little show. brother and uh, in... yeah, yeah, yeah. It, what? We, uh, it was. It wasn't little brother. It was just me. I was doing my solo record at the time, and Knife was spinning for me. Oh, okay. And, and but we opened up for uh, Rakim and, and Kid and um, Masterclass, man. It was just I was just sitting backstage taking notes. So. Thank, Thank you, man. Me, brother, for Thank real. you. I appreciate that. Little brother, you got to come out another joint. Now, right? I need another joint. Oh, no, nah, we work. Rock. We yeah, working, brother. We working. Good, 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 good. Well, on behalf of Sugar Steve, it was the quietest episode of Quest Love Supreme ever. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> DJ 101. I'm just enjoying the quiet, yeah. man. All right. Enjoying the quiet. No, like, yeah, we're yeah. just you playing. We miss you. you. Yeah, Kate, Kate Capri, thank you for rep. Rep in New York so well all these years and New Jersey. Hey man, it's the Bronx, baby. It's the Bronx. There you go. Yes. <laughs> go Yankees. Go Yankees. <laughs> yeah. So on behalf of Elia and Sugar Steve and Unpay Bill and Fontigolo, this is Quest Love and the great legendary Kid Capri on Quest Love Supreme. Uh shout out to uh Brittany and, and Jake holding us down and uh our good friends at iHeartRadio. And uh we'll see you on the next go round. All right, peace. <laughs>